So hello everyone, welcome to series three of the Mindful Eating Clinic podcast. I'm delighted to say that at this point in time, which is September 2022, we're up to over 21,000 downloads. So thank you so much to everyone for whom the podcast has been interesting and has been obviously engaging because there's something about it that you like. So that's a real, real thrill for, for me. Um, and so the first of my uh, mindful meets in this new series is with my guest, Guy Shahar. Who Hello. Is, who is there? Yes, he is. And for those of you um, who are listening on podcasts, you might also like to know that we are from this series forward on YouTube in video format as well. So if you're intrigued to see what Guy looks like, you can watch this also on YouTube. <laughs> and those of you that are, you can see that he's shaking his head. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yes, so my guest, Guy. Uh, so Guy and I met um, at a networking session run by the only networking group, that's O-N-L-E. Um, and we sort of hit it off because there's a lot of like-minded stuff that we do and that we think about and so when he agreed to be my guest on the podcast I was uh, delighted that his answer was yes. So we're going to have a nice informal chat about what Guy does, how he got into what he does. This is quite intriguing isn't it because if you haven't read the blurb you don't know what we're going to be talking about. Um, but then we also have some quite interesting news about a collaboration about a programme that we've put together, which we believe is really going to tap into the needs of a great many people out there. That's a bit of a, a taster teaser, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Anyway, enough of my preliminary ramblings. Guy is an energy healer. And his business, his practice is called Heartful Healing. He's a heartfulness meditation practitioner and trainer, and he is also an autism advocate. And we will talk also about autism in his life and in the life of his family also a little bit later. So lots to get stuck into. Finally, Guy, <laughs> a moment to speak. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think... Um, it would be quite interesting just for you to start off just talking about what your business is. So what is Heartful Healing and how did you get into it? Heartful Healing is uh, basically people come to me with whatever problem they have. And uh, this, this, is, this is the part that a lot of people find is new, a bit strange, a little bit spooky, even or woo woo, which is that uh, I use something called energy healing. What is energy healing? How can we do it? How can we do anything and bring about a change in somebody's life over Zoom without needing to speak um, or, or anything like that? The answer to that question is I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I don't understand the mechanics of how it works. You know, I could talk about quantum theory a little bit if you'd like that. I could, you know, talk about the 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 you know the the the, the foundations of it. But really, having that experience of well, my experience of sitting here doing going through some simple, really simple workflows with people. Um, on the other side, maybe suffering from pain or maybe have some sort of blockage in their life or something. And literally during the session, seeing the pain fall away or seeing them lighten up or something like this is something that happens very frequently. And um, still now, after all these all this time doing it, I still think, well, that change must just be a coincidence. It can't be anything to do with what I'm doing. I'm just following some simple processes. Um Wow. But it's very consistent and it really works. And basically all it is about it, it, it works through. And this this sounds very nebulous to a lot of people. And it would have done to me as well before I actually found out that I could do it. Uh, it works through intention. And and so the, the thing that a healer brings more than anything else is their own intention, their own condition, their own feeling of, of basically love and positivity and well-being for the person uh, that they're working with um and that enables them to tap in 
to whatever energetic um, activities are necessary to be able to do the work. So I spend the first part of the session um, really not finding out what the problem is, but finding out what the goal is that the person wants. How do they want their life to be? Mm. And, you know, just spend a short time, maybe two or three minutes, creating a sort of solid vision of that. And I ask the person to bring into their experience uh, in this moment while we're doing the work, the experience of that vision as if they had it now, as if it was in their lives now. So to feel it, to feel in their bodies what it would feel like, to feel grateful for that thing that they have. Um, because it's, you know, it's so easy for us to dwell on our problems. Mm. And, you know, there's an old phrase, uh, where attention goes, energy flows. Mm. So if we put our attention on what's wrong in our life, mm. we're all energy workers in a sense, all of us, just without knowing it. We put our attention on something, we are directing energy towards that thing so if we think about how miserable our life is how bad our relationship is how terrible our financial situation is and we're thinking about that all the time we are directing our own energy towards that our energy is much more powerful than we can possibly imagine that it is mm -hmm. and we're creating more and more obstacles in our way to the life that we want if we instead this would be my one tip i know one of your questions later on was going to be what one tip Go for it. Go for it now. <laughs> I, i'm, I'm just just covering it too much earlier but the one tip is to put the intention not on how terrible things are and how unfair that is but make that switch to thinking about the vision that you want and imagining as much as you possibly can um that you have that in your life at this yes. moment and what that looks uh, like and what that feels like yes what and it looks like and what it feels like exactly yes. and i and i'm i'm just i'm just thinking i'm just drawing parallels with some of the things that i say to my clients so i use neurolinguistic um pr programming um and in an nlp we are we're always trying to encourage people to have more of a positive forward motivation rather than an away from so that you're not you're not therefore con always thinking about the negative the problem the issue that you're trying to get away from because by that very nature you are focusing on it but much more thinking about well what does my happy life with food look like what does my positive yeah. behavior around food look like what does it feel like you know and so that's 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 really really interesting and I can see that I mean all of us know don't we just even on a very low level if we wake up in the morning and we make a decision to breathe and smile and think positively about what we have irrespective of what that is that we that we have some gratitude even if it's this for the sun shining or for the fact that we have woken up yeah that then sort of sets the day off if we yeah if if we allow it to and if we embrace it if we allow it to that's the important part because yes. if we do it with a sense of obligation yes. with a sense of oh my god i've got i suppose i better do this and without any real expectation that it's going to result in anything then it won't you know yes. but if we do it with that positive intention that you know i'm doing this to make a difference to my life and i feel positive about what i'm doing mm -hmm. then it, i don't think it can really fail to change us it's interesting what you said about starting with a goal, starting with somewhere that actually somebody wants to get to. Yeah. Um, and this question is going to be twofold. Firstly, do you find that most people are quite clear on that or do you have to really help them get to that point before you can actually do any, any of the any of the healing? And then secondly, you say you said in your introduction that people can come really with any kind of problem. So that could be emotional could it also be physical as well yeah it would yeah so uh let's do the first question first yeah which was um i've already forgotten it sorry <laughs> oh how how many people um well no i i don't think pe usually people don't need a lot of work occasionally somebody it, it's just a foreign language for somebody to think in positive terms mm -hmm. but m for most people they can get there with a bit of prompting quite quickly and easily um most people don't come with a vision most people, I mean, I do uh, have an intake form where I ask people to to have, you know, think about their vision so they have a little bit of a step ahead. But it's so common and it's so expected in our society that we don't, that, that we focus on the negative. We focus on our problems. We focus on what's wrong. 
Um, so naturally, people come and they tell the, the first thing they say to me is, I've got this problem. This is what I want to work on. Nobody says, I've got this vision, which is what I want to work towards as a first mm -hmm. step. But most people get there quite easily. And then the second part of the question on physical pain. Yeah, it's it works brilliantly. In fact, physical pain is one of the things that this is most quickly, you know, so um, I've actually just I, I, I'm in the process of sort of formulating a new healing method of my own and i'm testing it specifically on people who are in pain because that's the quickest and easiest way to find um uh to find uh, you know out whether it's working or not mm. typically if i'm working with somebody who's in physical pain whether it's some acute pain from an injury that they've had recently or even something that's been going on for a long time I would say that in two thirds to three quarters of cases, there's some change during the session. Sometimes it's a dramatic change that the whole thing disappears. Sometimes that it's it's uh, it's a, you know it, it's a, the start of an improvement. But I, I'd say at least two thirds of the time, there's, there's a there's a real noticeable change in the pain, and it's simply because where does pain come from? Where does physical pain come from? On an energetic level, it comes from the energy being blocked in the body, energy not flowing where it should flow in the body, energetic pieces being in the way and displacing other bits of the body. And so it's by releasing those energetic problems, those energetic blocks that we get the energy flowing and it's the body that heals itself. So I don't heal anything. I just remove the energetic blocks to allow the body to, to be able to heal itself. Yes. And let's share then with the listeners and the viewers, the fact that when we first met, um, so I had a long, so I have, I've had a chronic hip problem. In fact, I've had surgery. And when we first started to talk, I think I was um, suffering from every time I went to stand up, it was sort of catching and it was hurting for the first two or three steps every single time. And it was creating a lot of sort of um, tension as well as dis discomfort. And we had a session on it, didn't we? and you worked with with me to do exactly what you're talking about and and I can honestly say I have not had that catching ever since and, and I that was just one session was it yeah, yeah yeah just one just one and I don't know how it worked and I can be the <laughs> biggest the biggest skeptic uh, on these kinds of kinds of things but as far as I'm concerned the evidence kind of spoke for itself um and also let me give you a plug the session also was so 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 comfortable and so easy <laughs> and so, and i mean it was just it was a very sort of relaxed process um and even the process itself was so i think cathartic is not quite the right word but sort of releasing just you know through the questions that you asked um so i just thought i would share that that i'm a I'm a positive recipient of um, of heartful, heartful. Good, thank you, Laurie, and I'm really glad about the hip. Yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, have you always done this, or is this something that you started? It's an interesting at a question. Points in your life. So, I started it at a certain point in my life, quite late in my life. I was forty-seven or forty-eight, I think, when um, I. Uh, what happened was I had a healing session myself uh, because I'd been through a process of, you know, work related stress that had left, you know, it given me basically a physical breakdown. And I'd be, I was trying everything to get back on track. And one of the things I tried was energy healing, a different type of energy healing. And the person I was working with, she trained in the emotion code while I was working with her, which is, you know, the, the first thing that I learned. Um, and I had a session with her. It was a way of basically re releasing energetic blocks from repressed emotions in the past um and during the session i had this voice in my head it was my own voice saying you should try this um you could do this and i was like no i don't think i could <laughs> this is this is not the sort of thing i could do but i listened to the voice you know i couldn't forget it um and i sort of did some research and i i sort of looked into looked into it a bit i i sort of started to learn the basics of it and I found that, you know, I, I could do it. I could do what I needed to do to do the method. And then one day my um, 
I had this searing pain in my back, really terrible pain. And it was going on all day and it was heading for the evening. And I thought, oh, there's no way I'm going to sleep tonight. And my wife said, you know, you're learning this emotion code. Why don't, why don't you try that? And I thought, OK, can't hurt. Mm. So I went upstairs. I released a bunch of, of trapped emotions on it. By the end of that session, the pain was in half. Um, all of the inflammation had gone because she, she took a look afterwards and she went, Guy, the, the inflammation is totally gone. It's like gone right down. There's nothing left. Um, and the pain carried on increasing. And that's when I thought, you know what? <laughs> there, there's something in this. Yeah, actually works. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, this actually works, which I wasn't expecting. You know, I was, I learned it because of this annoying voice in my head, which was my own voice. Um, <laughs> and um, but, but, but I found it worked. And then I sort of tried it on other people. I tried it, you know, I was doing it on friends and family. It was working for them. They were referring people to me. So that's how the business started. Mm -hmm. But on the question of have I always done it, it, from what I just said, it sounds like no. But I have been um, doing heartfulness meditation for more than 20 years. And for nearly 20 years now, I've been a, a trainer in this. And what a trainer does is, you know, if you I mean, I never sort of made the connection before, but essentially I'm working with people on a remote, you know, either it could be face to face, but it, but even if it's face to face, it's remote because it's sort of they're sitting on the other side of the room or something. Mm -hmm. Um, or they might be on the other side of the world, but I'm working with them um, in, in a spiritual way and bringing about changes uh, through me to them. Um, so in a sense, yes, I have been doing it for many years, but in a very different way. Yes. And so that sort of meditation, how does it differ from perhaps other forms of meditation that might be more familiar to people listening or watching i think i think it needs to be it needs to be experienced i mean i can talk about it but it needs to be experienced to be understood it's like it's like energy healing we can mm. talk about quantum physics but it needs to be experienced to, to know that it works basically this um this meditation it was it was the discovery of a ancient yogic technique the rediscovery of an ancient yogic technique about 100 years ago mm. and the technique was around um the transmission of divine energy uh to us as human beings and then through one human being to another human being um and that transmission enables the um the essence of that person to be revealed beyond the human being the, the sort of spiritual essence of the being so right at the beginning we give three individual sittings to 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 each person so that they can you know but the purpose of those three sittings is to sort of basically clean away all of the all of the grossness, I guess, that we've accumulated during our life, and and if you believe in these things previous to this life as well, mm -hmm. um, that's stopping our spiritual progress, that's stopping us progressing into the spiritual beings that we want to be. Um, so that then, following those initial three sittings, we're in constant receipt of of this divine essence, this divine transmission that's coming to us all the time. And what the way that I experienced that in my life is, you know, most of my sort of tendencies to to be, you know, to be negative, to be um, emotionally overexcited and things like this, they all, they've all calmed down. And what I find, you know, really early on, I found this during the meditation. Now I find this 24 hours a day that I have this really nourishing presence continually with me in the heart mm -hmm. and that's you know literally without now having experienced this for so many years without this I, I i can't imagine existing in this world without without this yes within me it's so and, nourishing yes nourishing and just incredible and and it 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 actually brings to mind um a conversation that i had with um a very a very experienced and very lovely yoga teacher called Helen who is elsewhere on the podcast and in part of that conversation she shares that she had some really troubling periods in her life I mean she's she's still young but when she was younger and that the meditation particularly really really helped not only helped her through it but created this mindset which seems like too small a word really this this sense of just being able to deal with things in a positive 
sort of um, let it go, non-judgmental, non-punitive way that just means that, yes, she she gets irritated by things. Of course, we all do, but it doesn't permeate any further. It's a bit like an irritating sort of insect. It's there. You observe it rather than rather than take a stand on it and exactly. get attached to it and, and have that and identify with it. Exactly. And and of course, all of this is not a question of believing in any kind of divine being. I mean, if you have faith, fine, you might link it to that. But it, but you don't need necessarily to have any religious faith, do you? It's about that sense of some kind of, as you say, um, spiritual connection with ourselves, really. And and um, and of course, if we can have that level of positivity. And that sense of calm and that sense of perspective, I think also it is actually, it just enables so much possibility in, in life. And, you know, I, I, I am, um, a friend came to visit me and she had this, she had this t-shirt on, I remember. And it said, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. And I just thought, well, Actually, that's a pretty good starting point. And sort of having that that more sort of relaxed, open, generous, peaceful, positive sense allows us to be more of that of that ilk, doesn't it? It allows mm. us to achieve more. It allows us to actually live in perhaps a more sort of harmonious environment. You know, and there'll be some people going, oh, what kind of planet are you on? You know, look at the world, disaster. Yes, I know. But at least within our own sense of who we are, we can have that that positivity and that calm and that peacefulness that sort of allows us just to elevate ourselves just out of that to actually live, live better and live perhaps perhaps in a more fulfilled way as well. Yeah. And how does the world go from where it is now to something that's more peaceful, to something that's more fit for us as a, as a human species? Mm -hmm. It's by multiple people. It's like more and more of us going on that inner journey, making, as you say, that connection with ourselves, mm. becoming more of who we are and less, uh, you know, this this is a whole different subject, but, but less about living through our fears mm. and less about sort of, um, you know, uh, wanting to dominate other people because we're worried about our own place in the pecking order. Yes. Um, once, you, once you get beyond that, then we're in a position to start creating the world that we all say that we want, but but we don't necessarily act to create. Yes, and there's a there's a very um, a very strong connection here with what you're saying and what I try and advocate to my clients. So that sense of how we fit within the world, that sense of looking at other people, looking for things like external validation, um, comparing ourselves to others which which can be so damaging particularly in the area of body image and behavior to actually be sufficiently accepting because we don't we don't have to love everything about ourselves but at least to be accepting to actually just go forward and make a lot more of what we have and not compare ourselves all the time and not feel like we have to we have to look like someone on Instagram or we have to look like someone on the television on yeah. Love Island, don't get me started. But you know, those those kinds of those kinds of images that we're faced with, if we had a stronger sense of who we are and our own identity, we wouldn't be quite so vulnerable. We wouldn't be, you know, there's so many young people out there, aren't there, that that I think through, you know, through I think there's quite a lot of vicarious living going on for young people and I think I think I think TV and 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 games and computers and devices have quite a, have quite a strong responsibility in that um but actually because that's going on they don't perhaps grow up and and establish their own identity quite as strongly as maybe we did you know x decades ago and then when things get tough and when they're faced with these images of perfection say they're not strong enough within themselves to say that's her stuff that's not my stuff or that's him I don't that's that's not my world I'm going to watch it for entertainment but I'm not as you said earlier it's an observation rather than something yeah. that I'm going to take on and bring to myself yeah and whatever I am in a sense 
who am I to judge whether that's good enough or not? Mm. Who am I to demand that I should have more? Mm. Because it's not a very humble thing, actually, <laughs> to, is it? To, to think I'm not happy with myself because I'm not good enough. We think of it as, you know, someone not thinking much of themselves. But really, if I think that I'm I'm giving huge um, emphasis to my judgment, I'm thinking that my judgment, I know what uh, what I should be. And um, I might not even apply the same judgments to other people, but I'm making demands on myself. And, you know, if we're going to have real humility, it's like I am who I am. And that's fine. Just like anybody else is fine who they are. Yes. And it, it makes no sense to judge, to criticize myself, because who is it who's doing the criticizing? Mm. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of thought going on in my head. Can you hear the constant? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and well, I was slightly hesitant in that because I, thanks, some of my listeners will know this, but because I have a background in performing, there are so many lines that come up. There are just an opportunity to connect with the musical theatre, and I am reminded of um of a of a song in La Cage aux Folles, which is sung by um one of the the male uh, leads who is a who is a drag artist and his song is I am what I am I am my own special creation and I just <laughs> think absolutely you know that's that's fine to be playing that in your in your in your head um so yeah um so in your day-to-day -day work then you you are connecting with people and you're you're trying to tap into enable them their own bodies to heal themselves it sounds like it might be quite quite tiring is it is it do you feel do you feel quite drained by it when you're when you're going through this process not so much as I used to at the beginning I did mm. um now not so much uh I'm not really sure why even but it's but not so much yeah as long as I as long as I don't overdo it do too many people in a day or something yeah 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 yeah, yeah. sure sure um now one of the things that I always ask my guests to reflect on is whether they have any or if they'd like to share any um experiences with their own relationship with with food because that is a thread of course you know that that gets picked up so did you have any thoughts on that on that guy that might huge be issues with food oh, all through my life? Oh. Oh, who, who doesn't? I don't know if anybody never heard anyone who doesn't have any or has never had any huge yeah. issues with food. Yeah. I think I used, you know, like most people, I used food emotionally. Mm -hmm. I had a um, you mentioned the autistic connection um, earlier on. Um, I, I'm autistic, and, but I didn't know that until I was 46 years old. So um, I had a lot of experience through my life from early childhood of not being understood because literally you know what is the difference between an autistic and non-autistic person it's not huge it's you know a slight difference in or even a big difference in how you process sensory stimulation how the how the brain works and the thinking process but these are you know these are relatively minor things however what happens is that um because 99% of the population are non-autistic they think in one way there's huge misunderstanding of how autistic people think, how they frame things, how they communicate. And that misunderstanding very often, unfortunately, leads to judgment and, you know, misinterpretation and then, you know, enmity of some sort. Mm. So I had huge experiences of this, um, which was obviously traumatic and painful. And I think I used food emotionally a lot. And there was once I remember I went on um, some training of some sort in uh, in America uh, I think it was in in Georgia or North Carolina, somewhere around there. And, um, you know, they brought, you know, when it was the break time, they brought out these lovely, great plates of watermelon and stuff like that. And everybody was like, um, uh, you know, just nibbling these things. I realized at one point that there were two of us, me and another man who were actually just grabbing this food as if, you know, as it like Homer Simpson would grab. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever seen the Simpsons, you know, like he grabs a plate of donuts. We were like grabbing these watermelons. The only difference was um, he was obese and I wasn't. And the only reason I'm not obese is not because that my behavior wasn't sufficient to make me obese. It's just for some reason at that time, my metabolism was working differently. But my behavior and my emotional eating was exactly the same as, as, as this person. And when I sort of looked at him and, and I looked at what I was doing, I thought, 
do you know what? I, I've got a real problem here. Mm. So that was the first time I really realized I had uh, a, an eating issue. I, I didn't really do much about it. And over time, over the years, more and more foods have become uh, inaccessible to me. I'm not able to eat them. Um, You're not able to eat them because of a fear of l lack of control, do you mean? No, 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 because because they now affect my body. Um, See, probably okay. probably because of years of, of overeating those, oh, those types of foods. Mm -hmm. um, what I have learned more recently to do is to listen to my body because my body will guide me to what foods I need. Now, there's a difficulty with that in that if I'm eating or when I was eating a lot of junk food, a lot of, you know, these uh, these bars that have chocolate, have fat and sugar uh, and a load of you know chemicals all shoved in one thing they totally um you know affect the chemical balance of the body um and i think they also uh, affect our ability to understand what food we need when we're full of pathogens from these foods that we get from these foods we're eating for the pathogens the pathogens voices are louder than ours mm. and they compel us to eat what we what what is probably not good for us mm. So when I got to a state of really healthy eating, which I did, I went through a period of a few years of just eating pretty much fruit and vegetables. And that's by choice. That's mostly what I eat now as well. Okay. Um, it sort of cleared out all of that stuff. And um, it meant that I was much better able to tune in. You know, the things that I was craving then were the things that my body needed, whereas before I'd be craving the snacks and the chocolate bars and the high fat, high sugar yes content Sugar, food yes. that, yeah, that yeah. the pathogens yeah. wanted i didn't want them yeah absolutely because it's so easy to get into a into a cycle of the blood glucose peaks and troughs and the taste and the sense and um and of course one one exacerbates the other so the more we're trapped in repeatedly eating those foods the more then we um crave them um and it's it's interesting because I talk to my clients a lot about about hunger and about different types of of hunger and one of those which ties in quite nicely to what you were just saying is a nutrition hunger so that actually you you think you're hungry because the body needs a certain type of food or needs better quality nutrition and instead you just keep feeding it the lower quality nutrition foods that's not good or bad I mean and I'm very careful in how I'm um approaching these these labels but um be, because of that you keep just giving the body the same the same kind of food that it doesn't need and it's still going to tell you that it's hungry and so that yeah. can be a really strong driver for overeating and people don't yeah. don't necessarily make the connection about the fact that it's the type of food that they are eating that actually is making the difference or if they change that that it could make a dramatic difference and the body wouldn't be crying out and and i think if you say to people you just have to trust your your body i mean most most dieters and most people that have issues with food they they eat using their head and of course the minute you go on any kind of plan it's it's laid out for you and you're counting calories so it's all up here am i allowed it how many points have I got left? Is it a sin? You know, all of those kinds of things. So we are, so we're eating very much from our, our brains rather than saying, am I actually hungry? Yeah. Firstly, you know, understanding what are my physical symptoms of hunger and they can be different. Yeah. And is it, or is it just the fact that it's 12 o'clock or is it just the fact, you know, that I'm, yeah. that I'm, that I'm thirsty? Now, all yeah. of these things, and not to say that that is the way not to eat. Yeah just throw that one in because some of the dieting advisors will say oh you don't need to eat just just have a glass of water well yeah. if you're hungry you need to eat but you know it's um some people will say well I don't I don't really know how to how to trust so actually trying to educate people that that the body is such a powerful machine this sort of comes full circle doesn't it the body is so 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 powerful if you can switch this off a little yeah. Apart from deciding perhaps on an appropriate choice at the time, yeah. you know, the rest, just leave it to the body. 
Yeah. And sometimes it might be surprising. It's like I've I've had times when I've, it's happened a few times in my life, actually, where, you know, I, I've maybe had some stomach problems or something, I some digestive problems. But I felt, do you know what? I really fancy a big portion of chips <laughs> and I've gone and I've had a big portion of chips and it settled my stomach. Mm. And it's because I was, you know, normally I wouldn't have the idea to have them. Yeah. So if I had the idea to have them, there's probably something there. With my wife, it happens. She sometimes has um, a can of Coke. You know, sometimes she just craves a can of Coke and it sort of seems to sort out her issues as well. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So so, you know, sometimes it could be one of those foods that we might yeah. not necessarily you know think of yeah 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 interesting um I just wanted to go back a little bit just to just to talk about um autism and and and, and because of your experiences um you're now uh, running a charity aren't, aren't aren't you guy called transforming yes. autism do yes. do please tell us about this just in case anyone listening is 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 interested to explore that a little further yeah. So basically, um, it came from my uh, my experience with my son, actually. My son is autistic. He was born in 2009. Um, 2011, it was really clear that, you know, uh, things were really difficult for him. Um, we, we basically lost all communication with him. Um, and so we looked around. We, we didn't find any support that was meaningful to us, that, that felt like it was going to help. So we ended up finding um, a, a clinic in a small village in the north of Israel called the Mifni Center that we went to. Um, and it was a it was a really amazing um, center because they just work with one family at a time. They have all the therapists and the whole staff focused on one family, ridiculously expensive, of course. Um, and. Um, you know, and it's it's so gentle. They they understand the children so well. They work with very very young children. I think now they only work with children up to two. And um, you know, through through that understanding, but mostly with as far as the child is concerned, through play, they bring that child to a state of calmness and a state of trust, and they build really strong relationships with the child. And and he was a totally different boy when we came back. He was so you know joyful and balanced and you know he, he then he was sort of stepping into himself more and he was working on his development more um and he's still a re i mean he's had challenges since then with bullying at school actually that's that was the only real setback um but he's still you know an incredible child really really we're really proud of him um and the charity was about um bringing as much of that experience to families and as much of that understanding of how to create a relationship with the child, with an autistic child, how the parents can best do that in a way that makes the child feel safe, feel understood, feel like they've got a strong relationship and they can trust their parents to understand them and respond to them in the way that they need, uh, basically to, to, to form that foundation. So there's a number of ways that we do it. We, we've got a number of... Um, materials on the website and on our youtube channel we've got webinars done by sort of very experienced um child psychotherapists with specialism in autism uh, i do a podcast with uh, an american child development specialist called andrew shayan which is uh you know he's called autism for parents mm -hmm. so that's also on our youtube channel and um you know we've just started working with families directly so sending therapists out to work with families. We, we're just in a very small number of areas at the moment. We're just in the Oxford area and the Colchester area. Um, uh, but, you know, sending a child psychotherapist, an occupational therapist to do a proper, you know, professionally designed. It was designed by Norland College for us. Um, uh, program, uh, intensive multidisciplinary program to really help the child, but also to help the parents understand the child. Um, yeah, and, and eventually our long-term goal is to um, uh, to bring a, a, a version of the Mifni Center to the UK uh, because, because it doesn't exist here. Right. Um, but we also, you know, we also challenge conventional conceptions of autism. People think of autism as a disability. People think that autistic people have, have problems and difficulties in life and anxieties because autism is is somehow a curse on them 
And we say, no, that's not how it is. The difference between autism and not, not being autistic is, is, is relatively small. Mm. The problem is with the, the misunderstanding between those two groups and the fact that the autistic group is, is so small that they're the ones subject to, to, to be coming off on the wrong end of that understanding. But now you're starting to get studies come through that back up. There's one that was done by, I forget the lady's name, Catherine Crompton, I think, at the um, at the University of Edinburgh, that's showing that, you know, in terms of even of sociability, there's no difference between autistic and non-autistic people. So they got groups together. They got put people into pairs. They got hundreds of people and put them into pairs. Uh, sometimes they were autistic pairs, two autistic people, sometimes two non-autistic people, and sometimes one autistic, one not autistic. The only group that had any problems whatsoever was the mixed pair. So, you know, it, 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 the, diff, the the difficulty is not because the autistic people have the difficulty. It's because there's that misunderstanding between the two groups. But in a society where 99 percent of people are not autistic, it looks like it's the autistic person that has the problem. That's so it, it's the way that the research is going. It's the way that the thinking is very slowly moving to. Mm. But I, I did a TED talk about this, actually. it's It's got over a quarter of a million views now. Um, but but it, yeah, it's it's gone down very well with the autistic community because it's giving this really empowering message. Yeah, and it is my son's story as a as a as, as the a vehicle for it. Oh, wonderful! And I will put all those links in in the blur, both on the podcasts and also on YouTube, so that people can um, find it. And you've you've also written a couple of books on it, haven't you? Also, guy. Uh, one book about my son, about the journey that our family had. Yeah. Uh, I got another book coming out next year, which is basically a collection of articles and interviews about autism that, yeah. that I've done, yeah. um, some for parents, some more general. Uh, yeah. my, my first book was a book of short stories. It was a totally different. different. Oh, thing. OK. Well, still my Great. Lovely to talk about it in any case. Um, <laughs> oh, well, the best of luck with that, because that sounds like a real eye opener and something that's necessary to improve both the experiences of autistic children and 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 adults and families but also for those who aren't autistic to just have a greater understanding and tolerance and and I think society is generally moving isn't it in that direction towards much more openness and um, acceptance and also invitation to sort of invite difference and embrace difference um, you know hurrah to all of that um so it would be exciting perhaps if you you know pop back or let me know what's happening with that sure. and maybe pick up again on it um but I promised it at the beginning didn't I for um for us to share a little bit about our own program that we've been uh, working working on um so it's going to be called the conscious eating program um and uh, I think I should just let you talk about it since you're the guest. <laughs> well, basically, it, it's um, it's about approaching e eating, you know, getting to a state of, of conscious eating, getting to a state of um, a really balanced relationship with food in uh, in a way that, you know, because the chances are when you work with people, Laurie, um, you know, you'll you'll sometimes come to a point that people get blocked because there's just something that's stopping them from making the behavioral changes. There's some sort of inner resistance. When I work with work with people, sometimes um, uh, I can get blocked because we can remove those those compulsions and that inner resistance. But people have got so much into the habit of uh, of of eating in a way that's not optimal for them that it, it, to make that change is so is so big. So we're bringing both of those pieces together. We're removing the inner resistance through the energy work that is that that's causing the efforts that they make to be unsuccessful, and we're um, through you working on their behaviour towards eating um, to enable them to make those changes once that resistance isn't there anymore. So by bringing those two elements together, it's really. Um, you know, unblocking the different sorts of blocks that we might each come across in our work individually with people. Brilliantly explained. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. And therefore, empowering somebody 
with this comprehensive approach. And of course, not forgetting that there will also be some very sound nutritional um, advice also as part of my, my um, sessions within the programme. And the programme is a six week programme, although it's worth saying that for anybody for whom the unblocking takes a little bit longer or for whom the eating behaviour change takes a bit longer, then there will be options to extend that. But largely it's been, we're going to promote it as a six, six week programme. Um, and for anyone listening within the next month, um, we are going to be running a webinar, a free one hour webinar as a little taster, an introduction to what Guy does and to what I do and be available to answer any questions on it by way of introducing and explaining what the programme might be. So that is going to be on the 5th of October at 7.30 and that'll be BST, British Summertime for anyone listening around the world. Um, I'm now going to hesitate. I think we will record it. So I will have it available. Um, and then there'll be an early bird offer because the early bird catches the worm, a highly nutritious worm, of course, um, mm -hmm. in order for you to um, take advantage of signing up to the programme at a preferential rate. And I think we're gonna run that for about the first few days aren't we after the webinar guy um but there will be information in the link within this podcast and on youtube and you can go onto the web page that guy has set up for us and you can find out more about that and also the link to sign up for the webinar which is free just turn up you can be on camera off camera you can ask a question not ask a question doesn't make any difference at all just turn up and attend in whatever way is actually comfortable to you. And we look forward to seeing you. If you're listening or watching this after the 5th of October, then the link to the webpage will still be valid. Um, and you can email either Guy or me and ask any questions at all. And we'd be very happy to answer them. I think that's about all I need to say now, isn't it, Guy, on that? Yes? I think so. Guy is nodding, nodding, nodding. Um, good. So, um, anything, anything else that you'd like to say to our listeners? So, you very kindly gave them one tip earlier, and I was yeah. just wondering if there might be anything else that you'd like to oh, tell them, that's or cheating. anything, <laughs> or anything that you'd like to tell people that you're going to be doing over the next, the next short term, where they might be able to find you. Like where they might be able to find me is heartfulhealing.co.uk very good um but you might also like to check out the youtube channel because there's a lot of videos there um the latest one for example has been about addiction um so about all sorts of different things to do with healing there's a load of sample sessions on there as well oh, um nice. so recorded sessions of people who i've worked with so you can see what it's all about um and you you know there's some also introductory videos to the emotion code the body code um i will link to this one as well mindful eating uh, conscious eating recalling it yeah. because um the, you know this is going to be a core thing as well this is new yeah so uh yes that's uh, if you just go to youtube and search for heartful healing and look for a logo that looks a little bit like this one in the top brilliant corner. but i will put a link on the blurb anyway okay thank you well excellent thank you so much guy time flies when you're having an animated conversation yes it does thank you very much for joining us I think that's been a really interesting thought-provoking conversation um and if anybody wants to know any more wants to get in touch with Guy to see how his heartful healing might be able to help you in your life both emotionally and physically then I would I would heartily recommend getting in touch to have a chat with with Guy so there we are. And I look forward to seeing uh, all of you and to talking to all of you for the next episode of the Mindful Eating Clinic, Mindful Meats. So from Guy and from me, thank you. Bye bye.